RPV TV presents Studio RPV, the Peninsula's local news show with co-hosts Maria Soreo and Liz Brown Swanson. Hi everyone, welcome to Studio RPV. I'm Liz Brown Swanson. I'm Maria Soreo. Here we are in Rancho Palos Verdes, Liz. It's June and we have big news. And what is your big news for the for the day? Well, we have really exciting news. Two. It has to do with Peninsula Seniors. That's right. They finally have a permanent home. I know you had a chance to go down there, and they have really been working on this for so, so long, and it's finally happened. It's beautiful. I saw the pictures, and yeah. tell us a little bit about it. So what happened is, as you know, you're saying Peninsula Seniors, which mm -hmm. was founded 37 years ago, have been trying to find a permanent place to yes, call home. Forever. In fact, they were here at City Hall for the, over the last 10 years in temporary trailers. But right. Fortunately, under the great leadership of our former RPV Mayor Ann Shaw, who's okay. president of Seniors, yes. and a lot of team players going out to raise the dollars needed. That's what they, they needed. They were able to open up a beautiful center. It's right next to the library um, on Deep Valley Drive, so perfect location, right? Centrally located. And, you know, they really do so much for, and we shouldn't even say seniors. It's really the older community, um, but they've got, like, day trips, and they teach bingo and mahjong, and, I mean, you name it, they do it. They're busy. We have busy people people here. Yeah, they do have, and you don't have to be a senior to belong. You don't have to no. be, and right now they have about, from the peninsula I was going to say, they have over a thousand members. Yeah. But now with this new senior center, you're going to expect the numbers to probably soar. You and I might even want to hang out there and play some Scrabble. Never know. Never know. Maybe but some poker. They've been celebrating since they opened their doors, and I went to one of the, it was a dedication day, mm -hmm. and so let's check out the new yeah. Peninsula Senior Center. I would like to welcome all of you to the dedication of our new senior center. I think this was going to represent a permanent location. It's going to be a lovely spot where seniors can just drop in, have a cup of coffee with a friend. They can continue to do their classes, but if they want to just hang out, they can hang out. Your generous contribution made this happen. What do you think about all this? This is amazing. I mean, I can't, they came from a trailer. <laughs> it seemed like it was time. <laughs> they needed a home. Now, your name's on the building. Are we going to see you here regularly? Are you planning to stop by uh, and participate? I'll stop by occasionally, yes. I still live close, you know. Congratulations. You did so much to make this happen. What do you think about the center? Well, it's lovely. Well, I'm just glad it finally happened. And the furnishings are fabulous, which they did on a shoestring, I understand. And I really like the, the room next door with holds 100 people for lectures. I think that's just fabulous. It happened. We are sitting in your executive director offices. How do you feel? We're standing in them. There'll be no sitting today. It's a very exciting time. Now going forward, what's going to happen here? We are planning on expanding our program offerings. What do you participate in? Well, I love to travel. And so I love the trips that we go on. I'm more interested in the social activities and they'd be able to meet people and greet people. I think it's exciting. I mean, they've actually moved 16 times and they've been around since, I believe, 1979. They started with 400 members. What a cool place to be. I mean, they were just over near City Hall and bungalows and, and now here they are in this beautiful building. I think it's wonderful when a community comes together, they can just do anything they make up their minds to do. Oh, it takes a village. This is your village. This is your building here. It's a great location for the seniors to be. Absolutely perfect location. It's in the center of the Palos Verdes Peninsula, for one, and also to be next to uh, the wonderful library and the new assisted living that will open early next year. I think it's wonderful. It's going to get more members, I'm sure. I'd just like to say come down, take a look, and join us. You know, that is really beautiful, state-of-the-art, the Scriba Family Center, Peninsula Seniors. Go down there and check it out. It's great. Right. The address is 602 Deep Valley Drive, and they've redone their logo. The website is pvseniors.org. You can check out all the wonderful activities. There's things happening every day. So many things to do. In fact, Congratulations, too. To yeah, me. absolutely. So when you're done there, you can just hop on over to Terranea. They're yes. still celebrating 10 years, 10-year 10 anniversary. 
It's been a lot of fun to have this resort in our community. I really can remember has. like yesterday, the ribbon cutting, which was held in June. So this is the official month for 10 years. That's right. And just kind of amazing when you think about the property, um, where it is, it's the old Marine Land site. And that, that meant so much to so many people, especially people really that live in our community. A lot of people worked there, they're still here. And um, that's kind of the focus on the story that we're about to see is really the relationship between Terranea and our community because they are so involved with, with charitable organizations, having events there, um, and it's just really come together as one. And they found the perfect person to head up their community relations department. She is an RPV resident, yes. Gay Van Sands. Is that who we're shining the spotlight it, on? It is. She's going to tell us a lot of special things. And what I love is that because she is a local girl, she lives here, she can really give so many insights to things, just like Lily Amini does at Trump, that maybe people that don't live here don't know, so it's very cool. We knew from the very beginning that for the for the success of, of, of Terranea, we needed the buy-in of the local community because of where we are, because we understood the value of the land and the wonderful legacy that we had in being given the privilege of, of working on this piece of property. So we knew that the community was important. And so from day one, we literally opened our doors and said, treat us as your own backyard, please come. We showed people around, we had coffee mornings for Terra Neighbors before we opened. Um, we had thousands and thousands of people come through in the first few days just wanting to see. And we said, yes, please do, come see, this is yours too. So it's always been a focus for us to be part of the community, to be invested in the community, to participate in any community activity. and. It, it's, it's been a reciprocal thing. We've got as much out of it as the community has. And I think that we have a really unique position. I think everybody has shared in our success, taken pride in our success, and we couldn't have done it without them. Nelson's is on the old Marine Land property, and you've always appreciated the history of, of how much that meant to local people. Yeah, that's been very much our focus, to honor the history of the land on which we sit. and. It, it's an interesting thing. I did a marine land reunion in 2010, and it was really remarkable how many people who had worked at marine land still had such strong memories. We do make an effort to participate in everything off property as well as invite the community on property. So yes, um, whether it's the street fair, which we've sponsored every year for the last 10 years, whether it's whale of the day, and, and we always attend, we do things like the tree lighting at Christmas, which is designed, yes, for our in-house guests, but mainly for the community. We've always, we started with music on the meadows, and it's always been a concert venue here. We do Shakespeare by the Sea. We've done that for 10 years. The PEF's main event, we have a relationship with the PEF, the Education Foundation, and this will be their 10th one here um, coming up in May. So many events events are also celebrating 10 years along with us. You knew you were going to work here. Did you know you would be here 10 years later? I don't think I really thought that far ahead. I'm very happy that I am. Um, and I think we all take pride in, in what we've built. And there are 120 plus people still here who started all the way back in 2009. So if you think that we started with just over 400 people, 25% of those people are still here. It's, it's a testament to the culture that we've built and the amazing work environment that we have here. Why would you leave? Gay has boundless energy. She really does. She does. And our next story is about another super powerful woman on, in the community. There's a lot, Liz. Yes. There's a lot of powerful women in RPV. You got it. We love it. We got this one. That's right. But um, her name is Deborah Paul, and you know her. She is a writer for the PV News, yes. the Daily Breeze. She also writes children's books, and she was a flight attendant with the Flying Tiger Lines. Do That's you remember right. This? Do you remember I, this? I remember them from a long time ago. Right. So what happened is after World War II, a mm -hmm. group of pilots founded the Flying Tiger Lines, and it was a passenger and also a cargo carrier line. Right. And there were about 250 flight attendants, and Deborah Paul was one of them. But then they, FedEx ended up taking them over. But since that time, 
Deborah was saying that she and a lot of the former employees that get together every year, they're a wild, fun group, which you can imagine wild when you're a flying tiger. And only you would get invited <laughs> to a party so that was me. wild and fun. So she okay? invited me to the, um, a reunion <laughs> she had recently at her RPV home. And uh, let's go join in with Deborah and the party. Let's and we see. are going to have a wild time. <laughs> Hi, Thanks, Margaret. Margaret. Right now, I'm having a Flying Tiger flight attendant pajama party for all my former flight attendant friends that I used to fly with. I started working for Flying Tiger when I was 24, 1974, so you do the math, and um, did a lot of different things for them. I was the first female in the hangar, and I used to work in the stock room, and I rolled those tires out to the airplane and drove all the forklifts. I did everything the guys did, and then uh, I ended up uh, they had openings for the uh, flight attendant jobs, and most people didn't know that Flying Tiger had flight attendants, but they leased two 747s, and they flew military and independence all over the world. I absolutely loved working for Flying Tigers. So did you get to fly with Deborah? Yes. Debbie yeah, was just, well, like I said, she's a hard worker, but she's um, very creative, lots of fun to be with, for sure. Uh, we just bonded. And it didn't hurt that we're from the same area, because I used to live here. You have the eye of the tiger. I mean, you do so much. Um, you are a writer, a, you've published children's books. Share about that part of your life. Ever since I was about seven years old, I knew I wanted to write. I knew I wanted to be a flight attendant. And I thought, well, flight attendant was a way I could build up adventures. You know, I come from a you know, relatively poor background. And so being a flight attendant was a way that I could see the world. I just knew that I, if I had enough adventures, I have stuff to write about. I've always written, you know, I you know, wrote for the Easy Reader, wrote for the LA Times, wrote for Orange Coast Magazine. So I've, you know, I've managed to turn it into, you know, a lot of different genres, but it kind of segued into my children's books. What I've got right here is a ballad series. And these were all inspired by real people. Uh, Misty Copeland was one inspired by one. Uh, Alice Robinson, who was a brigantine captain. So that, that series is all inspired by real people. But right now I'm working on one called After the Ark, and it's where all the animals went after the ark. I'll show you, I'll show you one illustration. You'll get a kick out in, in, this, in my book. And this one was inspired by my granddaughter and the women I used to surf with. That is actually me on the, on the surfboard. I could do a headstand on the surfboard. Are you still surfing? No, I'm not. No, two, one hip replacement, two knee replacements a few years ago kind of put the kibosh on that. I do have a website. It's called Deborah's Library, and it's in, it's in, the, in progress, but there's enough information on there. If somebody wanted to buy a book, they could contact me. But I do talks. I do talks to the local, a lot of the local groups. One of my philosophies, and my books all kind of go along those lines, too, is that I believe in kindness. If somebody's kind to me, I can get through anything. And I believe in, you know, paying it forward and all the good things in life. Deborah Paul, you are a remarkable woman. I feel grateful to know her, that she's an RPV resident, and you should be reading her stories. Fabulous. Amazing. So, all right, and when we come back, it's June, and you know what that means. It's a busy month for weddings, and we are going to talk love and marriage with a wedding director from the Wayfarers Chapel. Home fire drills give your family a plan of action. Show everyone two ways out of the house, pick a safe meeting spot, and get there in under two minutes. Then practice so everyone knows exactly what to do. Go to ready.gov slash fire drill and learn how to prepare your family. Well, the month of June marks the very busy wedding season. Very busy wedding season, especially here in Rancho Palos Verdes where we have the Wayfarers Chapel, Liz. The glorious Wayfarers Chapel right That's up right. the street here in RPV. For over 60 years, couples from around the world of all faiths have been going there to get married. It is historic. It was built by the famous architect Lloyd Wright, mm -hmm. and it's right here in our community. We love it. And joining us now to talk about getting married at the chapel is one of the wedding directors who's been there for... 30 years. Welcome, Deborah. Yes, thanks for being with us. <laughs> Thank you very much. Tell Thank us you. how you got involved in being working in weddings. Truthfully, yes. there was an ad in the newspaper, and I had a one-and-a-half-year-old son, and I thought, hmm. And so I went to talk to Reverend Harvey Toffel, who had been there a long time, and it was for Friday evenings and Sunday afternoons. Wonderful for, with a little baby. That's the only days I worked. It was a set schedule. It was wonderful. It must be so special to help couples get on their way. I can't even imagine. You've been there for 30 years. How many weddings you've been involved with, and, and what is it like to, to bring you know people together for this? It's wonderful. <laughs> the spot is wonderful. It's you know you see people go in the door of the chapel, and their eyes just go through everything, and it's it's the best. 
And everyone around here says, I dream about getting married yeah. there. And there's, I think people think that it's hard to book a wedding because yes. you're so popular. How, how far in advance do you need to do that? You don't. There's no waiting list. You could be married in June. There are certain requirements, certain appointments that you need to attend. Okay. You know, a, a conference with the wedding director, a conference with the minister. But the office is fabulous at getting all those appointments set. So you could be married in June, July, August. Sometimes they're always busy. Yeah, Four o'clock right. on Saturday is probably reserved. But if you're flexible and you want to be married on your grandparents' anniversary, oh. if you'd be married at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, you could do that. I want to know about wedding tips. I, I got married 30 years ago. A very traditional wedding, and my mom did it all really for me. Yeah. I was lucky. <laughs> I just basically showed up to church with my dress. That's and nice. It all. But there's so much details. Mm -hmm. yes. And also can be very stressful, too. Right. Take care of everything as early as you can. That's the biggest factor. You know, your music, your dress, your flowers, your photographer, video, if you can do that. All of those items, because as much as you have done the week of the ceremony, right, still is crazy. Has there been a shift with sort of the traditional way that weddings are put together, do you think? Um, I think probably a little bit. Um, the coloring of bridesmaids' dresses, you know, you know, it used to be all the same design. Mm -hmm. now, Anymore, huh? now you can have the same shade, and then maybe everyone has a different style. But, you know, the flowers are different. They're using the succulents. Oh, yeah. And so, you know, the, the boutonnieres are getting very beautifully detailed. The florists are fabulous. So if someone wants to get married in the world-famous Wayfarers Chapel, what do they do? They start by calling you? Reservations. No. Call okay. reservations or emailing. Mm -hmm. The ladies are wonderful, and then they'll talk about, you know, some of the uh, requests that the chapel has. You can't get married there. You, there's wedding renewals. Tell us about that. Right. Yes. Yeah. That's the first Sunday in June every year. Okay. It used to be included in the church service. You know, the church service is 10 o'clock in the morning on Sunday. And then I believe it was Reverend Jonathan that wanted to have a special event. So that's, that's really nice. what they're it's doing. Called marriage now. renewal. Marriage mm -hmm. renewal. You need to make a reservation. And they have. Uh, the renewal between the couple. You renew your vows. It's basically only the couple, not guests okay. or anything like that. It's just a special moment And they have a beautiful wedding two. cake out in the lawn. They, they have that. Wow. They have, you know, flowers for the ladies. They have a marriage certificate. That's nice. They, you know, and so, and then there also is a professional photographer. As we wrap it up, and one yeah. last uh, bit of advice for any brides and grooms to be watching or couples to be watching. Come and visit the chapel. Ah, Come that's a and good walk one. around the grounds. Right. Very nice. It's a beautiful the, the the building, the grounds, the visitor center. It's beautiful. it's a beautiful right. spot. Very nice. Well, well thank, thank you. you so much for being well, with us. Thank so fun. You. Now we're gonna it's take a pleasure. short break and when we come back, we are going to meet some very special baseball players and also some kids who love to horse around. Stay with us. Be nailed it. Welcome back. Well, this is the exciting part for Maria because we're going to talk sports. That's right. You know, here on the Hill, they've got a program called Challengers. It's a program where kids, I think from very young age to teenagers, can participate in, in baseball, basketball, and football. Um, kids with special needs, they're teamed up with buddies, and they really get to experience everything that any kid experiences when they play sports. You know, you've got three boys, mm -hmm. and you know what it w does for children to participate in sports. Sports. What an incredible program. It's an amazing program. We've done some stories before. Um, this is one of the latest ones in, in uh, baseball, and that's when they shared that they're also doing a basketball program. So um, let's just go check it out, and you'll see more. Ready? One, two, three, go! The history of the Challenger program, I'd say it's about 10 years ago today that we started uh, Challenger football with Pop Warner football. Um, we had three volunteers and one one person that was it and since then it grew to about two dozen and now uh, we started challenger baseball soon after that challenger little league baseball then we cha started challenger basketball so we have all three programs going on right now we have football baseball and basketball we're hoping to get a few more sports involved and have uh, just a good time doing it the kids seem to enjoy all the sports. I think they like more than anything having just a partner, getting outside, having some fun, playing 
playing games year round. Seem to generate a lot of smiles in there. So the kids do get uh, a lot out of this, both sides, the, the buddies and the uh, Chandra players themselves. I see them at the high school or the schools uh, eating lunch together. Uh, it kind of opens the door both ways. They get to see the light on either side and have fun and, and walk, walk down the hallways. I've seen some high fives. It's kind of an amazing thing to see. In the beginning, my son, like most special needs kids, wanted nothing to do with it because it, it meant change. And a lot of special needs kids, want n they don't want any change, they want routine. But eventually, he, he, he started playing and started loving it. And then soon afterwards, when a game was coming up, he was asking me when the game was and is he ready, what time was it, where was the game. So I knew he had bought in and he was excited to play and loves playing. And um, it's been a great experience for all of us. We realize these kids are our neighbors and uh, the parents are our neighbors too. It was just a fun little community that we had. Well, I'd like to thank Palos Verdes Little League today for their donation. Stuff like that really helps. Uh, it, it runs a program. We're all volunteers and we couldn't do it without something. What a great story, Maria. And you said the group, the Challengers, they've been around yes. for 10 years? Over 10 years, yes. And you can just see how the kids light up when they're out there playing baseball, just like you know any other child would, and just enjoying it. So it's it's fun. Wonderful, wonderful. Yes. And we now have more youth sports to share. We're going to trot over to the Pony Club. The Pony Club, the Portuguese Ben Pony Club. Yeah, another <laughs> very interesting story. You know, it's kind of like the Boy Scouts and the Girl Scouts, except that this group is geared towards learning about horses, bonding with horses, and you probably knew people growing up. I mean, I did. I had a friend that she had her own horse, and this whole area yeah. is filled Peninsula, with horse people. It's a, an yeah. equestrian community. My husband right. grew up with horses. Mm -hmm. I grew up on the East Coast, and we had, dogs, we had a yeah. stable that you could go and you could rent a horse. Right. I did one time. The that horse was it, huh? sat down, almost rolled over on me, and let's say I've never been back on a horse. <laughs> That's why I got sent to, to do this story. Now it's all making sense to me yes, now, exactly. okay? <laughs> but it was so much fun because you can really see the joy that they have bonding with the horses. And this was a pancake breakfast. It was kind of a um, fundraiser and to thank all the people that come together for them. So it was a lot of fun. Portuguese Bend Pony Club has been on this peninsula for over 50 years. And it's part of a national organization. So similar to a uh, girl. Scout organization. Ours is all wrapped around providing education through horses for our youth, both boys and girls, men and women. Now they've expanded it to include adults and people of all ages. So every year we have an annual pancake breakfast. We've been doing it the Saturday before Mother's Day, and it's a chance for us to kind of reach out to the community, say hi, thank you for, you know, having us in the Portuguese Bend area and um, supporting us. And it's also a fundraiser to help keep our club going. A Pony Club offers a variety of different events. We can do three-day eventing, show jumping, dressage. We've started Western dressage now, which my daughter just got the national championship this last year. We do tetrathlon. In fact, this club here, Portuguese Bend, hosted the regional tetrathlon, which several of our girls won titles in. Uh, that's run, ride, shoot, and swim. What's nice about our club is all the girls and boys keep their horses here, and so they see each other every day. In fact, that helps us when we have quiz competitions about horse knowledge, because actually one nice thing about our pony club is it teaches all about the horse and how a horse thinks, the parts of the horse and all. So they get together and they learn these things on a daily basis, so they're really strong when they compete nationally. Here at Pony Club, we really teach how to be good horse people, how to take care of your horse. You know, if your horse gets injured, how do you take care of it? You know, you don't just like freak out and be like, ah, you know, you, you say, okay, well, I need to, you know, stop the bleeding. How do I apply a bandage? Um, how do I just, in general, take care of my horse? We don't just, um, it's the horse first. You know, when you're done riding, you don't just put your horse away and then you go get lunch. You know, we make sure our horses get water, we make sure they're groomed, they're taken care of before we go and get lunch and get water and whatever. So horses first. Okay. <laughs> so you have the older members that help teach the younger members um, how to do things. So like even hanging a hay net, maybe someone's not strong enough to lift the water bucket all the way up and so say, hey, you know, can you help me lift this? And so people from other teams, um, people from your club, everybody is just totally there and happy to help. And what's interesting about uh, Pony Club too is that we're all 
team competitions. Uh, you know, usually horse riding is an individual sport, but in Pony Club, it's a team competition. So that's why it really brings a lot of teamwork, and, and we're such a family here, so it's, it's really special. I think that companionship, it gets them off of their electronics, and it actually, you touch, you feel, you, when you ride your horse, even if it's just grooming them, it's that that special feeling that you get. <laughs> when the kids see the horses, they just, their eyes widen and they're just like, wow. And um, one of my horse, uh, Shaman, he's he's really sweet. And he even the horses, when they see the kids, they just, they put their ears forward and they kind of light up too. Um, and so it's, it's really special when you see the uh, horses connect with the young kids for the first time. The Portuguese Ben Pony Club has now been celebrating over 50 years of being That's in right. our community. And I just want you to know, I did not eat any of those pancakes, but they sure looked delicious. I would have had it at least one. Did you bring me one? No. Nope. <laughs> Did not. But we're going with what? From pancakes now to appetizers, right? We are. We're going to keep on talking about cooking and we're going to hop on over to our councilwoman Susan Brooks's house. We call her our cooking councilwoman. There you from go. From time to time. She's an amazing chef. She I have to say is. That. And what did she make this time? Well, she's whipped up some very easy, quick appetizer. Do you want to know why it's easy? Yes. Well, half of it she makes from scratch, but the other half you get to start with frozen food section. You get hmm. the ready-made pastry puffs oh. you, know, you can toss in the oven first. So you get those done in advance, and then you're just making a mushroom stuffing, and mm. uh, we'll let the Councilwoman Brooks Ooh, show us yeah. how to do it. Welcome to another exciting cooking segment with Susan. We are going to make mushroom crustades. And we just, this is that wonderful recipe that you have when you really need something in a hurry. It starts with these little puff pastries. You can actually stick your finger in them, stick your thumb in them to create the hole. You cook them. We're going to only have a few ingredients in this. Shallots, these are going to be diced up. Garlic, minced up. Mushrooms, these are cremini mushrooms. And grape tomatoes, which I'm going to be quartering. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get these chopped. And then when these are chopped, we're going to add these into the pan with butter and olive oil. So we're going to get these shallots going first. And these are going to get started. And then we're going to be adding these mushrooms. I've got mushrooms here that I'm going to chop up. Everything needs to be chopped really small because it's going to fit into these tiny little pans. Chop, 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 chop. So we're getting this nice combination here of mushrooms and shallots. I'm going to add some salt and pepper to taste. Very savory. Always add a little bit of extra garlic powder. I'm going to throw in some garlic, minced garlic now as well. And I'm going to start quartering these tomatoes and then these are going to go in last. It's really nice to use also um, some fresh rosemary just to top it off. I'll get some from my garden. I'm still chopping. And then we're going to actually use a little bit of Parmesan. This is actually Parmesan cheese. So we're going to have some Parmesan cheese on the top of these. I'm adding some fresh rosemary right now that I'm chopping up into little pieces from my garden. And we're just going to get some little rosemary to flavor this off. You can see how lovely this looks, this mushroom crustade with shallots and garlic. And now we're going to add some, um, we're going to add some tomato, grape tomatoes that have been quartered to this. This is all going to cook together. And when it's done, we're going to fill these little wonderful darling pup pastries. So now for the fun part. We're going to stuff this wonderful compote into this yummy little puff pastry. Boy, puff pastries, have they revolutionized cooking or what? Especially when you can buy them in the freezer section. So I'm going to stuff this in, get a little bit of cheese on top. When you go to any really nice party and you see people walking around with these trays, this is what you want more of. Now for our piece de resistance. Mmm. Bon appetit. 
And yes, bon appetit, Maria. She always says, did you bring me one? I always she say, finally did. <laughs> you finally brought me one. I did. I had to sneak one over from her kitchen before the, you know, the crew was eating them nonstop. So I'm sure. here okay. you go, a mushroom crustade. All right. One for you, one for me. And you ready? Yes. I can't wait to take a bite. Mmm. 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 My God, it's so yummy. Mmm. Wow. I can't wait to make these. Susan, you got it. Susan, and of course, you're awesome. Fourth of July napkins ready to go. That's it's right. Up. Yeah, it's coming up. So get all your... Um, Favorite 4th of July things, recipes, all kind of things. And you could serve this because you've got the red with the tomato. You could. You'll just have to switch out the rosemary garnish and... That's right. Bring, you in. can bring them to the 4th of July celebration that we're going to have right here at, at City, City Hall. Hall. It's going to hear before you know it. You're going to be there. I will. Absolutely. All right. Well, all right. That will do it for today's show. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Maria Soreo. I'm Liz Brown-Swanson. Thanks for joining us. Have a great day, everyone.